My name is Jerry Fry. I am a senior program manager and associate vice president for AECOM here in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing this important content with you and providing an opportunity for knowledge transfer and idea sharing. Uh, as I said before, please utilize the Q&A chat function to ask questions. Uh, the Q&A facilitator will take over when it's an appropriate time to do so. There is a link to the PDH form and a link to the lobby in the main chat session under the word chat. Um, PDH certificates will be issued shortly after the conference concludes. Uh, if you have any technical issues during this presentation, please email the help desk at 2021 helpdesk at ash.pro. So with that, Sean, if you would like to, uh, to uh, take over and uh, begin your presentation. All right, thank you, Jerry, I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending both the conference and this particular presentation. Um, I'm gonna discuss the Opportunity Corridor, section three, uh, the design and construction, it's a urban project, so let's begin. Um, I want to give you a little project overview for uh, those of you not intimately familiar with Cleveland. Here's downtown Cleveland and uh, backed up one second. Here's downtown Cleveland and 490 here kind of dead ends at East 55th. And this is where the project of the Opportunity Corridor uh, happens. The corridor in its entirety is a three mile project. The first section here that you see in the purple kind of runs north south and was designed bid build project and completed in 2018. This little section here in blue was designed build and that was completed in 2019 and kind of stopped the south section intersection here with East 93rd. And then our project, the project I'll be talking about today, is the design build from 93rd all the way down to Interstate I 490. And the Project corridor itself uh, had several purposes. One, uh, and you'll we'll get into this a little bit more, is to deal with abandoned properties through this corridor. Um, there are also several brownfields uh, from factories and, and and other industry that's abandoned and left the area. Uh, where we cleaned up some urban blight, and part of the overall opportunity corridor, and I will say opportunities a lot during this presentation, is the opportunities for future economic growth. So all three of these sections have included um, in, in, the, in the project, power, storm, sanitary, and water with stub outs at various and key locations throughout the entire corridor for whatever light industry, uh, residential, um, and, and other business opportunities that would arise as an opportunity. Um, and you'll see here all these signalized intersections uh, was to make sure we didn't have another freeway where we cut the neighborhood uh, apart. We actually connected the neighborhood and made it a little more livable and uh, you know functional for pedestrians and vehicles. So uh, the overall sponsor, this was ODOT, Ohio Department of Transportation. And for our project, they had GPI helping with construction inspection and testing, and their owner's rep, kind of extension of their team, was HNTB. The prime contractor on the, the project was Kokosi Construction. Their key subcontractor was Independence Excavating, and there were 82, we'll come back to that, 82 subcontractors on this project. Uh, Michael Baker International, my firm, not really my firm, but who I work for, uh, we had one key subconsultant, Neil Robinson, and 14 subconsultants. We also had an independent quality firm, IQF, which was Richland Engineering, with two subconsultants. And they kind of called the balls and strikes on the scope and design manuals. Um, this was design build, so as long as you stayed within the constraints of the scope and the design manuals, it was good. Uh, and they called the balls and strikes on that. Uh, part of the opportunities here in the Opportunity Corridor was uh, diversity, outreach, and inclusion. So Brownstone Gray had two subconsultants, and part of their efforts were to make sure that the subconsultants and subcontractors um, came from the local area. They were from the city of Cleveland in the wards where this project was going on, uh, hence the over 100 subcontractors and subconsultants we had working on the project. For those who are playing, for those of you playing Logo Bingo, 
these are all the logos of the major stakeholders and players that appeared on the project. As I stated, our part of the project was an approximately two mile long um, with six signalized at great intersections. We had three BMPs for the storm sewer systems. It was a mix of uh, basins and manufactured systems. We had sanitary and combined sewer systems uh, with a new Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. It's hard to say that aloud, so we go with NEORSD. Uh, if you don't know what a regulator is, hold tight. We'll learn on that. Uh, we had new underground systems, as I stated, new storm sewers, Cleveland Public Power's distribution along the entire corridor, uh, 16 inch water lines for future use and sanitary lines. The additional features on the project include seven bridges. Uh, one was a railroad bridge uh, under Norfolk Southern tracks. We have two pedestrian bridges um, to allow accessibility for everybody uh, at East 59th and East 89th. Four roadway bridges uh, at 55th, Kingsbury, Kinsman, and a pair of blue green. Uh, the retaining walls are associated with East 55th and Kingsbury. Um, the project was broken down into 29 buildable units. Uh, 33 active units is what we ended up with. 18 of these buildable units were Michael Baker responsibility. 15 were subs and had some and some sub involvement in all the buildable units and Michael Baker had oversight of all of them. As of right now, all 33 of the 33 have been released for construction. And for those of you not familiar with design build projects, a buildable unit is a standalone design package. It can be an area discipline, say a drainage area. Uh, it, it can be a, a total discipline like street lighting. It can be schedule specific. Let's say you needed to get a parking lot relocated for an active business. So it would include the striping and the signals and the signing. Uh, another example of a buildable unit would be a bridge by itself with the retaining wall back, the retaining walls attached to the bridge. Uh, the overall schedule, this was designed build, so it went fast. Our bids were open on February 28th and we got notice proceed March 26th of 2018. A week later, we started design. About four months later, construction started. We finished the design, hence those 33 buildable units all released for construction uh, in April of 2020 which was when things got interesting for all of us. Uh, and our scheduled substantial completion is this fall. Uh, the project completion is summer of next year, but that's gonna be the, you know, the, 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 the signing, well, not the signing, the striping, some of the plantings. Uh, nobody wants to plant anything in November here in Cleveland because it would die and be brown and be a waste of time and money. So they'll, they'll do the spring plantings uh, early next year. The awarded contract value is just over 150 million, and today the current contract value is just under 160. There's a lot of coordination on this project. Um, ODOT was the owner. We had the city of Cleveland with ward people, uh, the various wards that the project runs through, the traffic department, construction and engineering department, the Cleveland Public Power, Cleveland Water Department, Water Pollution Control. I already mentioned NEORSD, the regional sewer district. We had Norfolk Southern Rail. The Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, uh, light radar, light commuter rail and bus routes, they're the uh, public transportation for the city. Uh, we had private utilities and we had all of them but steam. And there is still some steam that runs in the heart of downtown Cleveland. And then we had the community action groups, this is going out to the diversity uh, outreach to make sure that the people who are living there got an opportunity to be part of the project. I'm gonna quickly walk through the schematic of the overall project, and then we'll start getting into the pictures, which are far more interesting than listening to me talk. So here at the very west end is I-490. And prior to our project, I-490 came to East 55th here and stopped. And you hang a left to go north or south. The pink blobs that you see on the screen are the bridges. So our project brings I-490 underneath East 55th, where it becomes Opportunity Corridor. And then you use what we're calling the quadrant roadway to make up the vertical difference to get up here to East 55th. East 55th is a major north-south movement. The GCRTA station here has not only buses, but um, the light rail that runs through here. So people in the community in this area use the RTA station frequently. And that's why we have this pedestrian bridge here at East 59th that allows all the folks in the neighborhood to 
walk over the opportunity corridor, kind of staying at grade to get to the station. As we continue to move east, we go over the Kingsbury Valley. Uh, you can see the loop track here on another bridge. And this is RTA's uh, repair yard as well. So they would use this loop track for testing trains prior to bringing them back for more work or releasing them for use uh, in their system. As we continue east, we come to the first at grade intersection with Kinsman. Um, this is several at grade intersections. And as I stated before, the intent was not to cut the neighborhood off. It was to allow the neighborhoods to continue and thrive. And each of these at grade intersections on these streets had maintenance of traffic that we needed to maintain uh, to keep traffic driving through the urban environment of this project. Um, we continue the east. You see a pair of bridges here over the blue green line, curved girder bridges. Uh, we continue east right here in the upper edge. This is East 75th Street that cuts in front of Orlando Baking to East 79th Street. Orlando Baking is one of the uh, economic um, uh, flagpoles of the city of Cleveland. It's, uh, when they found out this project was going through, they immediately started planning for expansion because they're only going to be a couple signals away from the interstate and allow them to expand their territory. Um, once we pass East 79th, we cruise under the Norfolk Southern Bridge. And what you're seeing on this red line here is with the lowering of the Opportunity Corridor to get under Norfolk Southern, all the stormwater is gathered and sent along the edge of the tracks to then be jack and board underneath the live railroad tracks here. This particular stretch is one of those individual building units I was talking about, just getting the water from here out to an outlet structure in this little triangle here. We continue. Traveling to the east, we come to Buckeye Road at Great Intersection. And when the Opportunity Corridor swings up to intersect with Woodland, East 89th Street here is kind of cut off. Uh, this used to carry vehicles and is being retrofitted to be a pedestrian crossing at this point. Uh, the intersection really didn't work with too many legs coming out. So this is just a four-way intersection. At the very end of the project, we hang a hard right and tie into East 93rd the ending of Opportunity Corridor Section 2, which was the finished in 2019. Sequencing of the project is also going to run east and west. Sorry, jumping ahead there. Um, and the first thing we did is we needed to install the, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District Regulator. Uh, so the sequence of this was to build the temporary runaround and close I-490. Yes, I got to close an interstate as part of this project. Um, the items we need to do is we need to maintain the RTA parking lot. There are buses, there are trains, and we need to maintain the flows to the existing sanitary regulator. Uh, we also need to work with top-down bridge construction. So what you're looking at here is we're looking north at East 55th here. Here's the RTA station. You can see I-490 um, is open and traffic backs up as they prepare to make their right or their left-hand turn. And this is the temporary runaround where we're installing temporary utilities as well. Um, this business was open and um, they were under business and continued working throughout the entire project, as well as the, the RTA station here. So we jumped forward a month and in June of 2019, I-490 shut down. We, sorry, uh, I-490 shut down. And we reduced East 55th to two lanes, but keep, kept the East 55th open in both directions, as well as access to the RTA station. You see the beginnings of the new regulator. So what is the regulator and why are we replacing it? I'm sorry, that keeps jumping on me. The regulator, you're looking at a different aerial picture here. Here's the RTA station. The existing regulator is here underneath the footprint of our proposed bridge. So we're moving the regulator to the south um, to make sure it's out of the way of this bridge and can still function, allowing this ability. The regulator rolls from south to north and then turns around if necessary and heads south. So why are we replacing the regulator? Well, if you look at the new bridge here, this is gonna be westbound, this is eastbound, the existing sanitary is this 96 inch brick sewer that when we were finished, we'd be driving straight through it. Uh, we did get lucky and that the storm overflow is deep enough. We didn't have to touch that one uh, outside of accessing it with our new regulator for 
maintaining the flows um, during a storm event. So what you're looking at here is the excavation of the vault that will hold the regulator. Uh, we're looking north. This is the 96 inch brick that we're going to be, you know, if we're further north would be removed as part of this project. And just to give you an idea of the size, these are 36 inch whalers holding the retaining wall or the walls up. This is another look. This time we're looking south. Here's the 96 inch brick sewer. And this is the deeper 78 inch concrete overflow sewer. And again, to just give you a scale of the size of how big and deep this project was. This picture might be a little hard to see, but I'm gonna give you a kind of an overview of what a regulator does. This 96 inch combined sewer comes in from the south. We, as part of our project, captured as much of the combined sewers as we could into a 30 inch. These two come in under dry weather flow into this vault here and exit out a 48 inch pipe that goes to the treatment plant. There's a plate that sits on top of this treatment, on this outflow, as well as an adjustable weir. Uh, during a storm event, the 96 and the 30 inch overload what's available to outlet and you have the combined sewer overflow, jump the weir, drop down into here that lands into the 78 inch and flows to the river. So during really bad rain events, parts of Lake Erie to the north are not available for swimming due to this contamination. The reason these are adjustable plates and adjustable weir is as more online processes become available at the uh, sewer plants, this plate can be raised and eventually removed as well as the adjustable weir here to allow more combined sewers getting to the treatment plant before being released to the, the river, Cuyahoga River dumps in Lake Erie. The other part of this is because we're lowering under East 55th, we're gathering all the storm sewer and bringing it underneath the, the 96 where it was, outletting it to the river once it's had, had an opportunity to be cleaned with a manufactured system. Um, for those of you that are wondering at home, this is 36 feet, this is 24 feet, and you can see over here, all that work happened 50 feet underground. The regulator had to go first so that we could then get to the East 55th Street Bridge and start working on the retaining walls. Um, there's a lot of utilities that required uh, addressing, very congested, top-down construction for the contractor. Um, the sequence of construction and some of the schedule, uh, these had to happen in a very precise order, the regulator first, then the East 55th Street Bridge, and you'll see why a little later when we get to Kingsbury. Uh, and we had some right-of-way constraints uh, as we're trying to do this work. I'm gonna show a couple boring plan sheets here. Um, this is the RTA station here, north is to your right. And the walls are 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. And you can see here in the profile where our new regulator is and where the bridge is gonna be. The bridge itself has all the utilities. Um, we've got lighting up here in the parapets in the pink. We also have a private electrical company riding, riding through here in the sidewalk. A 30 inch water line and a 12 inch water line needed to be maintained in the temporary runaround and then put on the bridge. We have a four inch and a six inch gas, 18 T duct works, the public utility, and a 16 inch sludge main, a uh, force main that had to be maintained throughout the work. So now this is the, some of the better construction pictures. What we're doing is we're looking east here and you can see the bridge itself has been built. We're still running on the temporary runaround. Uh, the regulator's been closed up and functioning properly. And what this allows is the contractor to start excavating from the west side to start getting the fill out and start getting the opportunity corridor lowered. Um, this is again looking north, uh, a little further along here, July of 2020. Uh, you can see wall 1A and wall 1C getting formed up here. And this is the right away constraints we had. Again, this business was being operated and people were working here all the time. Uh, and so we had to really be careful on both this private property and then working with RTA to make sure their substation uh, and, and stay outside of their right away work here. This opening here is that 30, sorry, the 36 inches you saw that will be eventually collecting the storm sewer that when opportunity corridor dips underneath the 55th entirely. This is looking west back to I-490. It's a little later on in the project. And you can see that we've taken the run around out so that we can, you know, 
start working on the east side of the bridge. You can see they're doing the formwork on the walls 1A and 1C, and so that once the runaround was removed, we can now start excavating the east side of the bridge. This was taken two months ago. You can see walls 1A and 1C are almost complete. That's fantastic. We're still running two lanes on East 55th. Uh, you can see the RTA station is fully functional. The buses come in, loop around. People can park their cars here, jump on the station or take the train. Um, this is the Opportunity Corridor wrapping around that brings you, sorry, the quadrant off of Opportunity Corridor that brings you back up the East 55th, allowing the North-South movements. And one more picture here, uh, just another aerial view. You can see wall 1B under construction here, wall 2 wrapping around East 59th Street here, uh, and here's the quadrant. If you look really close, you can see the pylons at East 59th Street here. And then this picture taken a mere month ago shows the ped bridges in place and the contractor is getting ready to, to finalize it. And again, this ped bridge is to allow all these residents at grade intersection or at grade access to get to, oh, excuse me, at grade access to come down <clears throat> uh, the walk to get to the RTA station here. As we continue to drive east, the next bridge we have is the Kingsbury Run Bridge. Um, we had some challenges here. We broke this into three billable units, the bridge itself, there are storm sewers and track and a catenary. Catenary is the, for those you don't know, is the <clears throat> electrical power that the trains run on. We need to make sure that the RTA tracks could still run. We were able through an ATC to get some bridge shortening and, and reconfigure the track. Those again, not familiar with design build, an alternative technical concept, an ATC is where the engineers and the contractors get to uh, apply their experience and their ingenuity to, to maybe save some construction dollars to maybe reduce long-term maintenance fees, maybe to come up with a better idea. Uh, this one was primarily to get a better cut fill balance. All that material that I re referenced being dug out underneath E55 was coming over here to fill in part of the valley. Um, we had some challenges with this one, soil conditions, and we had to maintain RTA functionality. Again, the hard to see plan and profile sheet, but what I wanted to show on this one is the sewer we were working with was a 108 inch box culvert here. And the red lines you see here were the exist it was the existing ground. So all of this area here and here was the fill from East 55th. Um, the original bridge in the RFP was 500 feet, and we got ours down to approximately 240 foot three span structure. This is a, another picture, but this you can see where previously we had the loop track for testing. Working with RTA, we install the Y track so they can bring their you know trains down here, test them, send them on for use, or send them back to the yard if they need additional work. Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. So now we're looking to the east and you can see where the Y track is going to be here. Uh, forward abutment, the rear abutment, and the reinforced slopes uh, as we're building up and filling in this valley with the material used from East 55th. This particular picture again was taken two months ago. You can see the rear and forward abutments are in place. You can see the uh, pier one footings are in place and the pier two stems are coming out of the ground. Um, they're, they're, they're working hard. Again, uh, where you have to substantial completion is this fall. Uh, this is another picture. Oops, went too fast. This is another picture. Just, a, a, I kind of like this. You can see the Cleveland skyline behind it to kind of give you an idea how close this is. Uh, and it being towards the end of March, you can see that they're working on the pier caps now for pier two. And we've got the pier stems, pier one coming out of the ground. As we come out of the east here, we come to the first bridge that's Kinsman. Not too much work at this particular at grade intersection, uh, other than the signals. Uh, a little bit of abutment work and to make sure the parapets blended in with the new intersection we're bringing through here. Uh, we did have to main tra maintain traffic on Kinsman 75th, 79th, Buckeye and Woodland, um, but the local network was close enough that we were allowed some detours, which which helped. But as you can see, this is a tight urban environment. You know, there are people living here and, and here, and you'll see a little bit more uh, working here. Uh, as we continue east, we come to the blue-green bridges. 
the blue green bridges were complex in the fact that separate bridges, uh, curved girder, and over curved tracks. So you had high skew and a variable skew, which gives the structural folks all kinds of fits. Uh, we also had some foundation challenges that I'll get into a second. Um, the catenary had to be adjusted and we needed to maintain RTA. RTA was running trains pretty much the whole time, except for very limited closures that were allowed. This is the boring plan and profile sheet that I wanted to show you. Uh, one of the items we had here was this 72 inch box culvert here in green uh, was in one place with the RFP. When we got out there and got our surveyors going, the box culvert uh, wasn't in the same place. So some of our pre-design work had to get adjusted. And to accommodate that, we installed 30 inch concrete filled steel tubes uh, to accommodate the adjustment in the, the pier locations for this particular bridge. Uh, this is looking west. This is the westbound bridge, Pier 1. This is the eastbound bridge, Pier 1. And you can see the proximity here to RTA. So there was a lot of coordination going on. Uh, these particular catenaries needed adjustment because of where the bridges were going to be to maintain uh, the opportunity corridors profile here and allow the train tracks to continue driving underneath. Uh, this is looking again east. So we're driving through. Here's the rear abutments. You can see the steel curved girders are in place. Um, this is Pier 1 for the westbound, Pier 1 for the eastbound. And this is looking west. So three of the four piers are integral crash walls because of their proximity to the RTA tracks. Uh, the rear abutments and walls are in place, the beams are in place, and the last bit of work to do here is the forward abutment. And you can see here back in March, the forward abutment work has already started. They're starting to do the, the deck work here on, on the westbound and the eastbound bridge. And as we move to the east, this is one of my favorite stretches of the whole project. It was the only straight and flat-ish section. Everything else was curved or vertically climbing up or down as the project drove. This was the straight shot. Um, this is East 75th. This will be at a uh, signalized intersection. And this outline in the dark blue here is the proposed site of Cleveland Police Headquarters. Uh, again, the opportunities are being presented and the city of Cleveland is trying to, you know, capitalize on where we can. This is the Orlando Bakery and we had several meetings with them. It was very critical that their water was maintained and clear, obviously the power, but maintained and clear because they were constantly making bread and nobody wanted to have rust water getting into the bread. They throw away a lot of product. Uh, that was something we paid very attention paid very close attention to and, and, and recognized. Um, as we continue to drive east, East 79th here is another signalized intersection. And again, this is where the corridor stops being straight and starts curving towards the north. Where we get to our next bridge, the Norfolk Southern Bridge. Uh, bridge goes over Opportunity Corridor. Uh, some of the design challenges is active Norfolk Southern tracks, 80 trains a day. Uh, we also had adjacent utilities we need to pay attention to. And anybody who's worked at the railroad knows that you have to go through NS design approval, shop drawings, et cetera. We had sequence of construction as well as maintenance of rail for this. We're not, you know, they weren't shutting 80 trains down. Um, we also needed to coordinate with Norfolk Southern to access areas of the track for survey and other items and needed to use their flaggers. And we needed their track construction at the very beginning to relocate temporary tracks. And there. Uh, let's try it again. Next slide, please. There we go. Again, the boring plan view, but this is kind of a short tra um, bridge. It's the shortest span. It's only 136 two span. Here's the center pier. You can see where the opportunity corridor is driving underneath eastbound and westbound. And so what you're looking at here is we're looking east and we're gonna do that we're gonna build the, the western part of the bridge first. So here's the uh, abutment, the pier foundation, and the other abutment will be here. We temporarily relocated the tracks out of the way so that we could build one half of the bridge at a time. Uh, this is uh, October of last year, where the western half of the bridge is just about complete, and you can see the tracks running over here. 
Uh, the CPP lines I call out here, this is that, you know, kind of look the transmission lines that we need to be cognizant of. And it's also helped, it helped me when I was, you know, walking through this to make sure where CPP for the orientation. This is particularly looking south. As of March 2021, we have now moved the tracks onto the western half, and we are now constructing the eastern half of the bridge. Here's the CPP lines for orientation. And if you'll recall, this was that red line where we're gathering all the storm sewer in this area and running it along the western half of Norfolk Southern tracks to, to outlet it somewhere up here in that North Triangle. As we continue driving through the east, this is a, a great picture of some of the, the brownstones and, and the, the blight that we're cleaning up with this project. When this is all finished and the project runs through here to Buckeye, these will all be open areas uh, available for expansion and, and residential or you know light or industrial. We don't know what's coming, but we plan for it. And we're hoping that this, this takes off and is an economic driver for not only the neighborhood, but the city of Cleveland. Uh, what you see here is Buckeye. This is the next of the signalized intersections at grade. And at each of these at grade intersections, there are existing utilities running up and down that we had to bring the new, oops, excuse me. We had to bring the new opportunity corridor utilities through either up and over, tying into, cutting underneath, making adjustments. So there was some uh, fancy footwork as we came to each of these with the underground utilities. This is the woodland uh, intersection here. The end of our project is up here. Uh, this is the East 89th Street Bridge that they started demoing. This will become a pedestrian bridge due to the new orientation of the Opportunity Corridor. You can see they've got the protection for the tracks here. Um, and this is a picture from last month where they're making further headway. You know, they've removed all the beams on top, again, protecting the RTA tracks from uh, any sort of debris or falling issues. And this is looking west. So Woodlands or Opportunity Corridor is coming from Buckeye here and swinging around to tie into East 93rd. Um, this particular picture of Woodland Avenue is it makes its hard right and ties into East 93rd. This one was critical in that these businesses were maintained as were these and the Ken Johnson Rec Center uh, part of the RFP was access to this center was to be open at all times. So prior to starting work, folks would drop down East 89th and tuck in here to the parking lot. We had to reroute traffic through here, bring them down, wrap around and install a temporary road here out of the way of Opportunity Corridor, but still permitting full-time access to the Ken Johnson Rec Center. Uh, part of the work is also widening and improving woodland to about here. So we had to negotiate and work with proper MOT for those particular companies to keep them moving along. The project as of April, 2021, this is the big schematic picture here. So this is I-490 where the project starts. We drive to the east and duck underneath East 55th here. Here's the RTA station. We cross over the Kingsbury Valley here where RTA's test track is, jump up to the Kinsman at grade intersection, cruise over and eat the over top the blue green lines here. Here's that straight section I was referring to before, East 75th, East 79th. We make the turn to duck underneath the Norfolk Southern bridges here, cruise up to Buckeye Avenue, uh, make the short jog over here to Woodland where the East 89th Street Ped Bridge is being installed, and we finish our hard right here at East 93rd. Some of the fun facts for this particular project is uh, 2,800 sheets were produced, uh, and Michael Baker had uh, produced about 2,000 of those. Uh, we spent over 45,000 person hours, which translates into 22 human years of effort, which it seemed like a lot. It didn't seem, it didn't seem like quite that much. Uh, the other interesting part is we had almost 100 people working on this project from 13 different offices. Um, in nine different states. So it really was a collaborative effort on our part and our subs part and work with the contractor. It was, a, it was a big team and a big push effort. And to that end, I would like to give special thanks to Kokosing and ODOT uh, for use of their aerial photos because the photos I think do a better job than, than me talking from a plan sheet. And with that, I will open it up for any questions. Sean, this is Jerry again. I want to thank you 
uh, for that presentation and for the audience. Uh, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about Sean because I neglected to do this uh, <laughs> at the beginning, and I apologize for that. Sean Milroy is a project manager and civil engineer for Michael Baker International in Cleveland. He has 25 years of experience, including projects ranging from high profile interstate improvements to local road and bridge replacements, as well as several years of design build experience. Sean is proud to be a United States Air Force veteran, city councilman, and he currently volunteers in multiple local civic and school organizations. Sean lives in Highland Heights, Ohio. So again, sorry I missed that earlier, Sean. And uh, so Bob, the uh, Q&A session is yours. Thank you, Jerry. And Sean, thank you for your service. Uh, that's great that you were in the Air Force. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's go ahead and do a little bit of housekeeping before we get back to Q&A. Uh, I'm going to post up into the chat um, the um, ASH 2021 conference program book as well as the PDH forum link. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that a recording of this session will be available for later viewing on the ASH National YouTube page. And uh, please do remember to submit your, your PDH forms. Uh, when you leave this session, you'll go to the main lobby. Please feel free to hang out, network, network with your peers, visit sponsor pages, and, and close the uh, close. Uh, excuse me, attend the closing session. Uh, after, since we got that out of the way, I guess we can go right to questions. So um, the first question we have is from William Gilmore, and he asks, "You mentioned that a major R." CRB, and I don't think I got that acronym right, at the interstate bridge was not located as per the as built or information provided. Was it the design builder's responsibility to cover the redesign? Uh, it was eventually our responsibility to cover the redesign, yes. Very good, thank you. Um, we're looking for some additional questions here, folks, so please feel free to weigh in uh, with any uh, questions that you have in the presentation. Um, Sean, you mentioned that there were some people brought on to do uh, community involvement. Can you talk a little bit about the interactions you had with the community and what kind of issues might have come up during construction uh, and prior to uh, construction that might have influenced your design? Oh, thank you. No, uh, it was uh, the community outreach was actually rather fantastic. Uh, ODOT and uh, the outreach group, they had several uh, public meetings. They had several, uh, we, we call them, you know, meet and greets where various uh, subcontractors and subconsultants would come to these meet and greets and they'd almost be interviews. Uh, and and the, the, the process or the, the goal was to include as many people as we could. Um, both Michael Baker and Kokosing had several uh, targeted uh, on-the-job trainings and, and other folks that we brought on for, for certain percentages. We exceeded all those percentages. And we, you know, personally, Michael Baker, we found two new subs that we're going to continue using on future projects. Uh, and right. I heard from the contractor that they've got a couple contractors that anything they do in Cuyahoga County, which is totally, you know, City of Cleveland's wholly contained in Cuyahoga County, they're going to reach out to those subs again. So from that matchmaking effort, it turned out to be way better than anybody had thought. Uh, the other part was to give, you know, give back into the community. So if, if the people are working in the city of Cleveland, the city of Cleveland's getting the tax revenue, but they're also getting opportunities to network and, and, and expand their potential business. So from, from that outreach program, it was, it was wildly successful. It was fantastic. That was the ped bridge something that was originally in the um, in the design, or did that come about as a result of community involvement and um, uh, public outreach that they wanted to continue to get to the station? It, it it moved, so that's a good question. There was originally a pedestrian bridge to make sure people could use it, uh, but where the location of the bridge actually occurred was was, a, was an outreach, or excuse me, was developed and finalized from some of the community outreach. So the original location shifted a little further east, tying into East 59th as opposed to the original location. Um, but that, yes, that, that's a pretty good example of where that pedestrian bridge is. Um, I did neglect to mention that the entire corridor has a multi-use path. 
So for connectivity of not only pedestrians and vehicles, um, there is a small sidewalk for peds and then a 10 foot, 10 foot wide multi-use path that runs along the corridor for those that want to bike. So that, again, it was, it was well thought out. It was well planned and uh, well, you know, I'll let you know again in November how well executed it was <laughs> when we get to the finish line. Great. Hey, uh, so here's another question. Um, were there any issues acquiring the right of way for the corridor? Um, fortunately, question. Yeah, great question. Fortunately, this was designed build. So part of the, the, the caveat of a design build is the environmental and the right of way have been cleared. This particular project, the right of way was cleared but we're now in the process of giving the right of way back to the city of Cleveland for their economic development. So there was a lot of work done by ODOT and their um, their engineers and, and their, their uh, sub-consultant HNTB to acquire all the right of way for the corridor. Um, and that now we're they're in the process of getting ready to finalize various parcels and pieces back to the city of Cleveland for the economic development. Okay. So people, I just want to remind you that you can feel free to enter questions in the Q&A tab under um, uh, on the right hand side of your screen um, and, uh, you know, feel free to engage the speaker. That's what we're here for. Um, you know, Sean, uh, I saw that some that utilities very clearly were a big part of this project. Um, I, I, but I noticed that you kept the combined storm sewer. So um, it, do you know, is Cleveland under a consent order with EPA regarding its combined storm sewers? Um, was there any, what were the regulatory constraints around that, if any? We are, and, and that's where that particular regulator, um, there was some massive modeling that went into the design and size of that particular regulator. It's they huge. are... Yeah, they, they are currently upsizing uh, a lot of the pipes and they are currently making improvements at all three of the treatment facilities in Cuyahoga County, um, but they're not there yet. So they're, they're starting at the treatment plant and kind of working their way back into the various neighborhoods, mm -hmm. hence the adjustability of th that particular regulator. Um, I know on another project nearby, they're looking at doing the same thing and they're using the model that we had developed uh, in the entire corridor, we segregated everything. It, there is sanitary and there is sewer, and th they're not mingled anymore. We did unmingle uh, several areas that had, you know, combined, but we're not there yet. But yes, the, the NERSD is under, I, I, I want to say, multiple billions of dollars are being spent to unmingle the combined sewers for their particular district. Yes. Yeah. So that, that is something that we've run into in the city of Philadelphia doing. Um, PennDOT projects. So very, very similar. Um, we have another question. Based on Bing aerials, it looks like the section north slash east of East 93rd Street is concrete, rigid pavement. Is that the pavement used for your section two? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it, it is not. Uh, again, design build, this is where the, the owner provides a, a sandbox for the designers and the contractors to play in, and they, during their RFP, had two pavement designs. So I don't know what the other teams presented, whether they presented concrete or flexible pavement. Uh, our contractor, in the pursuit, Michael Baker developed quantities for both because we weren't sure which was going to be less expensive, uh, meeting the specs that ODOT provided, and our contractor when the when we found out we won, said, "Hey, dust off the flexible typical sections because that's what we're using." Okay, so be it. That's what we're using. We 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 didn't know until we had found out uh, we won which pavement was going to be. Thank you. So we have another question from William Gilmore, who asks, "I may have missed it, but was there special coordination measures with all the utility, ODOT, rail, and neighborhoods?" Yes, uh, we once we got design going, um, we had a weekly coordination meeting, and depending on what items were coming up or going to come up, we we invited those particular uh, utilities. Uh, El Robinson, our primary subconsultant, uh, had a person at the project management office whose sole task his, his task manager was utility coordination. Yes, and then he had people working for him, but that was his sole 
job for the better part of two years was to coordinate with all the various utilities. Yes, that was a, a major part of the project because none of the utilities wanted to be cut off. They all need to be maintained. And so we had to figure out not only where they're going in the final position, but the temporary condition as we jogged around the various at-grade intersections or say at East 55th, that, that temporary runaround, we developed three different trenches and layouts and then the sequencing of when the water could connect versus the gas versus the power. And that sanitary forest sludge actually went to the west side and just got buried a couple feet underground once we were able to shut 490 down. Yeah, a lot of coordination. Yeah, right. Um, so just so you know, you've gotten a couple of kudos here in the in the chat. Uh, Stephen Rutke says, Sean, very impressive. Great job by your team. So there's an attaboy for you. Uh, Walter Tomasetti similarly says, super project, an excellent presentation. Thanks for sharing. Emily Preston, nice presentation, Sean. So um, uh, your, your presentation is being very well received. That's um, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad I didn't put anybody to sleep. That's fantastic. <laughs> if you uh, if you had to identify any schedule, were there any schedule issues, or are there any schedule issues you're running into, and and what are they? Uh, we we are running into a couple schedule issues. Uh, it's primarily some of the um, the the steel uh, is a little bit slower. Not the end of the world, and we found um, one of the precast uh, some of the larger uh, manholes, uh, almost a vault, if you will. Some of the precasters are having a problem keeping up with as, as the contractor gets closer to the finish line and we're installing all these larger manholes, the precasters having a little trouble catching up with and keeping up with the, the requests from the contractor. So they're, they're managing, but they're, it's a little, it's getting a little cringy. Any penalties or um, contract restrictions regarding delays? Um, we, uh, on the design side, we're moving, anytime the contractor has a question, we, we jump to it because we know it's tight on schedule. I'm I'm not sure what the penalties are. They're, they don't, um, I don't think they're gonna, unless we're responsible, I, I don't think they're gonna fall back to us. So we're doing our best to keep the contractor moving okay. forward, but I'm sure there's penalties. Okay. Um, again, I want to remind people you can post questions in chat. We're coming up on our time, but I want to make sure we give everybody an opportunity to, to weigh in and ask questions and, and uh, be heard. Uh, let's see here. You've got another, another compliment from uh, Nomi Roman. Excellent, Sean. Thank you. Um, that's always nice. To, that to is hear. always nice. Yes. Terry Snow asks, how you doing, Terry? Um, from a design perspective and looking back at lessons learned, what, if anything, would you have done differently? Very good question. Oh, boy. Um, I think we would have spent a little bit more money uh, uh, and, and pushed the surveyor to get a little tighter um, uh, survey on, on a couple of items. Um, the... The coordination issue with the, the the private utilities, I don't know that we could have pushed any faster to get some of their coordination. There, there are a couple of delays um, in that uh, they they weren't. You can only push a private utility to move so fast when it's on their dime, and I, I don't know of a better vehicle for that in particular. Um, design other design issues we would have done differently. Um, the it might have been. I don't know that we necessarily have done different, but the um, ability to model 3D utilities underground wasn't quite up to snuff when we started, or maybe it was just the beginnings. Um, we, we did have a couple um, utilities that when the contractor opened them up, the water line that we anticipated to be five foot underground was eight feet underground. Of course. I, of course. So quick snick, redesign the drainage. Does the drainage still work? Can you, if you lift the outlet pipe up three feet? Yes, it does. Okay. Ooh, wait, now you're in the way of the gas line. Whoop, shove it down a foot. Um, I don't know we would have done it any differently. I'm not sure we could have made a, uh, uh, gotten enough survey information to make that. I, I think the big part would have been, honestly, additional test holes to verify them ahead of time. I think would have probably been a good use of uh, early detection um, and and preventative money is being spent to, to, to stop it on the other side. I think that 
that would probably be my my first choice. I think until you actually start digging, you don't really know for sure. Especially in these really tight urban areas urban that have been around for hundred years. Uh, you know that 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 brick sewer, uh, and I'm sorry I missed it when they excavated the brick sewer and they had their first rainfall. I guess it exploded. There were bricks <laughs> that that kind of piled up and leapt out on their own. Um, and quite honestly, it was it was good thing that the contractor had sealed in the edges of that particular brick because when the first brick started popping free, it unzipped. The whole thing just opened up. So to give you an idea of how old all the infrastructure is in these neighborhoods, uh, we we did we did deal with some some age and deterioration that nobody was really anticipating. Well, we were anticipating, but we didn't know to the extent. Well, Sean, that wraps it up for our session today. I want to thank you again. That was a, a very interesting presentation on a very difficult and challenging project, I'm sure.